night, of course, being the first Wednesday night of the new year, it's a good opportunity to begin a new study. And I debated and prayed and, and wrestled with different study ideas, had some conversations with some folks, and have decided for the next several weeks, probably eight weeks at least, eight sessions at least, uh, to do what I'm calling Bible boot camp. I was never in the military, uh, but I, I have friends that were, and uh, some of y'all were in the military, you know what boot camp is all about. It's an intense period of training, of instruction in uh, whatever you're going to be doing uh, in the military, to make you a soldier, to make you somebody who goes from being a civilian to being somebody who is a soldier uh, by the time that period is over. And so that's what we're going to do over these Wednesday nights. We're going to really kind of dig in and, and really grab hold of the truths of what it means to be people of the book, to be people who have the Bible, who read the Bible, who study the Bible. Uh, amongst Christians, the most common New Year's resolution amongst Christians is, of course, to lose weight. That doesn't change. But the second is to read your Bible more. I don't know about you, but I have in my life, I have got up on New Year's Day and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do more than I've done in the past. I'm going to read more, I'm going to study more, I'm going to do more. And you may do really well until about January 4th. Um, and we'd be honest about that, right? You know, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, you know, you make all these preparations, you still don't stick with it. And so what this is, is not so much a way to beat us up and to say we need to do something, but instead, kind of a, a means of getting our frame of reference changed. So that we begin to see Bible study not so much as something we do because we've got to do it, but something that we get to do so that we can know God better and our lives can be changed. So that's what the purpose of this boot camp is going to be. We're going to look at different parts of the Bible, and instead of just being me up here talking, and then you go home and nothing changes, there's actually going to be some things that I want you to do between Wednesday nights in preparation for the next week. And, and they'll change from week to week, but you'll see that when we get done. And so reading and studying the Bible is truly really the most transformative discipline that any of us can ever undertake. And there's no single way that I can make any of you a Bible reader. Uh, one of the things I've learned in life is I cannot make anybody anything. I can encourage, I can admonish, I can maybe fuss a little bit, but I can't change anybody. So I can't make you a Bible reader, but what I can do, what I hope to do, is get you to the point where you see the benefits in it and you genuinely want to do this on your own. And what I'm talking about is not just reading the Bible to be getting to a reading plan. I'm talking about reading the Bible with new eyes so that God can do great things through that process. It is truly a lifelong journey. Now, you know me, you know I'm a book lover. I have thousands of books, um, and, and as I'm not ashamed of that fact, but uh, I do know that the day after I die, Kristen's calling the used bookstore to come get them all, so she has no use for them. But here's the thing I've learned about books. There are certain books that I can read them, and I would say I could skim them. And get everything I need to out of it. In fact, there's some books I can even read the table of contents and get everything I need to out of that book. The rest of it's just fluff. There's other books that I can read and read them maybe two or three times and really feel like I understand that book. The Bible, I can read it from beginning to end a thousand times and still there be more to it than when I started. That's the amazing thing about the Bible. That's why this is a lifelong journey. You're never too young, you're never too old to start the journey of reading the Bible, of studying the Bible. It's an act of discipline, which means sometimes you just got to do it. Um, you know, there are days, if you're following a reading plan, you're going to come across genealogies. And you're going to be reading the first part of First Chronicles. And you're going to be like, why is this here? Why did God have this written? But sometimes you've got to slug through it. And other times you're going, to, you're going to just want to just keep on reading past what um, you're 
assigned reading is for that day. There's going to be high points, there's going to be low points, but it's an attitude of the heart as we seek to meet with God on a daily basis. And it's a wonderful, wonderful discipline. So tonight, as we begin our boot camp, kind of in the way of overview, I want us to answer three core questions. First, why should I read the Bible? You know, why read the Bible? Why don't I just, why don't I just read other books? Why not read what other people say about the Bible? Why not just come to church on Sundays and listen to the preacher or go to Sunday school or be part of a small group? Why actually take the time out of your busy life to read the Bible? Well, that's a good question. I want to answer that question, but before I answer that question, I first want to answer a secondary question of what is the Bible? What is this book? You know, it's this book that we have. What is it? Why should we read it? Well, the two things about the Bible that make it both amazing and difficult all at the same time. The first is the Bible is a divine book, which means that ultimately God is the author of the Bible. And because God doesn't change, and God is always perfect in everything that God says and does, this book is relevant for everybody at all times and all circumstances. Okay? That's an amazing feature of this book. But it's also a human book. And that it was written by real people who lived in a real historical context. And therefore, to some degree, the Bible can be a bit dated in that it doesn't seem to always be relevant to our circumstances. Hence, the genealogies and other places like that. And you may get interested in reading your own family history and family tree, but reading somebody else's family tree might bore you to tears. So, so this dual nature of the Bible, that it's both divine and human, is one of the main reasons, I, and probably the, the main reason, why people struggle in developing the discipline of Bible reading. Because it's not like any other book. You don't read the Bible like you read any other book. Um, and, and that's something to be reminded. But you also read it just like you read any other book. So it's kind of that double-edged sword that can make the Bible both the most beneficial thing in your life, but also one of the most difficult things in your life as well. And so, uh, why should we read our Bible? Well, here's some principles for reading our Bible as to why. One, reading the Bible is essential for spiritual growth. Now, y'all came in tonight, Steve had prepared a delicious dinner, and you ate. Now, you could have missed a meal and probably been fine. You could have missed two meals and probably been fine. You may even go a whole day or two days without eating and be fine. But if you go much longer than that, you're going to start noticing it in your life. If all you have in terms of intake of Scripture is Sunday school, Sunday sermon, and Wednesday nights, if that's all you have, and no personal Bible reading on your own outside of that, how many of you could get by and be healthy if all you ate was three meals a week? You could. You'd have to eat more regularly. The Bible is essential for spiritual growth in that regard. We have to eat of God's Word to, in order to grow spiritually. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 2, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If you want to grow as a Christian, the first thing you got to do is eat. And what do you eat? You eat the bread that God provides, which is the Word of God. You eat the food He provides. So reading the Bible is absolutely essential for spiritual growth. Perhaps, and this may be more telling than we realize, the reason why so many Christians are so ineffective, the reason why so many churches are so ineffective, is because they're full of people who are starved. Starving for real food. Okay. Now, you know, there are times in life where, you, as, you know, as a baby, and, and maybe if you're in a medical situation, you have to be fed by somebody, and that's to get you by. But if you really want to enjoy uh, the, the growth that comes from eating, you have to feed yourself. And so there, there comes a point where you have to start just taking responsibility for your own intake of the Bible. Secondly, the Bible is how we know Jesus. 
You know, how else are we going to do anything about Jesus unless the Bible tells us? What's the song we learned as kids? Jesus loved me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How else are we going to know about Jesus unless the Bible tells us what we need to know about Jesus? That's why Paul tells Timothy that, that the Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation. What you need to know to know Jesus, the Scripture tells us. Uh, one of my favorite passages in the Gospel of Luke is in Luke 24, when Jesus appears to the disciples there on the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognize him. Um, I, I would have just loved to have been there because of what Jesus does. It says there in verse 27, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus takes the Old Testament and walks them through from beginning to end of the Old Testament and says, this is what's about me. They don't know it's Jesus, but he interprets them, he interprets the scriptures about himself and so that they can then learn from that. It's probably the best Bible study that's ever happened in human history uh, was on that event. So the Bible is about Jesus. Even the Old Testament is about Jesus. There's a tendency uh, among some Christians who want to separate the Old Testament and the New Testament and the danger with that is if you do that, you, you neglect the fact that even the Old Testament is all about Jesus. It's all about Him. Uh, even the parts that are sometimes a little tough are about Jesus. And then, of course, Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. We know Jesus through the Bible. So it's essential for our spiritual growth, how we know Jesus. And thirdly, the Bible is written for us and our encouragement. Now, I've heard people say the Bible is God's love letter to you, and that's a true statement. But I want to go a little deeper than that. I want to say the Bible is written for us in the sense that it's written for our lives. It's written for us to know God, to, to be changed and transformed by Scripture, by God's working through Scripture, and it's written for our encouragement and our instruction. That's why Romans 15 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. It was written to teach us that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scripture. Now, I want to give you a little grammar lesson here, because this is cool. You can see this a little bit in English. Through endurance, and then you could actually take out and through the encouragement, and the sentence still makes sense. Through endurance of the Scriptures. So what's the endurance of the scriptures? Plugging through it, reading it, committing to doing it. Okay, sticking it out. So through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. It's a good word. It's a good word for us tonight. That through the scriptures, we can be encouraged and have hope. And of course, I think we should read the Bible, not only because it's essential for our spiritual growth, not only because... Through it, we know Jesus not only because it's encouraging to us, but also because there's no other book like the Bible. There's just no other book like the Bible. It's, it's just the case. Notice how Psalm 19 describes the law of the Lord. It says the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Let's stop there for just a second. Have you ever been to a dry spell spiritually? And you just open up your Bible and you read something and it's just like God turns the light on and it just like it just just wakes you up, revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. The Bible is more valuable than money and more precious than sweet honey. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. There is no book like the Bible. So that's why we should read the Bible. Now, how should I read the Bible? There are bad ways of reading the Bible. We've all been guilty of some of these bad ways of reading the Bible. Probably the worst way to read the Bible is what I call the point and pray method. Okay? You know what the point and pray method is? I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw 
Okay, Lord, you're saying I'm king, and I see things. That's the point of pray method. Maybe you've heard the story of the man that that was his devotional reading, and he would crack his Bible open at random, point his finger, and whatever the Bible told him to do, he would do. Well, one morning, he saw his verse of the day, and you just went out and hanged himself. <laughs> so he thought about that for a second, thought that can't be true. So he did it again, and he opened it up, and it said, go and do likewise. <laughs> so he thought, well... Maybe God's got a word for him after all, but he can, God's not going to tell him to do that. So he opens it up again, points, and says, What thou doest, do us quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Point and pray minute is dangerous <laughs> because of that. Okay? Well, it's easy to take stuff out of context when that's the case. Perhaps the most out of context verse in all of Scripture is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, it's not about able to do anything. It means you can endure any of the circumstances of plenty or want. You can be content in any of your circumstances because you have Jesus strengthening you. That's what that verse means. It doesn't mean I can do anything. Because if I can do anything, we're in trouble. Okay? So, so we've got to be careful with the point of the prayer method. The other is the overly devotional method. And that's where you say... This passage has to mean something for me in my life right now. So here's going to be my new life verse. Okay, um, I, I debated between this one and Job 2.9. Job 2.9 says, Curse God, die. Uh, I thought that would be a good life verse. But 2 Timothy 4.13. Here, here's my new life verse. Because this has to mean something for me, right? When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. So that's your devotional reading for the day. What's God wanting you to do? He's wanting you to make a friend named Carpus, uh, which last time I checked, I don't know anybody named Carpus. Um, maybe there is, I don't know. Maybe we need to you know, tell the young expectant mothers if they hadn't picked out a name. There's a good Bible name for them right there, and it's Carpus. And uh, you know, bring a coat and uh, books, right? That's what Paul wants us to do. So we need to have a coat with us all the time and carry out a bunch of books. The early devotional method of reading the Bible would say every verse has to have some meaning for your life at all times. And that's not always the case. Sometimes what the Bible is doing is filling up your reservoir so that when you do need it, it's there. Not that you have to read something that day and have something stick out to you that particular day. So don't read the Bible in an overly devotional method uh, because you'll end up with verses like that. Or at the end of Galatians where Paul says, see what big letters I write when I write with my own hand? I mean, you know, like I said, it's a human book in places like that where it's just, there's nothing really to speak to you, but it's Scripture, and God's got it there for a reason, to help us when we need it. Okay, so maybe maybe that's, that's helpful for us there. And then another dangerous way and unhealthy way to read the Bible is the life manual method. This is where you view the Bible as a rule book or a guidebook for living, uh, which it is, but it's so much more than that. Uh, looking at the Bible just as a rule book or a guidebook, you know, looking for those little coffee cup verses that can fit on a coffee cup or those little snippets of verses. You know, sometimes... Um, for gifts, people will give you know, God's promises, books, they'll just have selection of scripture, and they're good things. But the problem with it is it misses the context. And it misses the bigger story of the Bible, the bigger picture of scripture. And it makes the Bible about us, not about the fact that the Bible is ultimately about God. And it's not simply about how we are to live. Though there's definitely a lot in there about that. That's not all the Bible is about. The Bible is about changing us so that we live differently, not just giving us a, a list of rules to check off. And so we've got to be careful that we don't read the Bible just as a rule book. Okay. So those are some bad ways of reading the Bible. Maybe you're guilty of those. I know I've been guilty of them before. And, uh, and so we need to read the Bible correctly. So how we read the Bible correctly, what's the good way or ways to read the Bible? Well, first, humbly and prayerfully. If this book is unlike any other book, and we need to approach it unlike any other book. And we approach it humbly. And we approach it prayerfully. We approach it with an understanding that God speaks to us through this book because it is the very Word of God. And so we approach it differently. We approach it humbly. And that's what Psalm 25 says. A couple places there. 
Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. And I don't know if you've ever had an experience before where you needed an answer to a question, but you were just too proud to ask for help. Maybe you were lost. And you didn't want to ask for directions. Or maybe you were in a store and you couldn't find something. And, you know, if you're like me. Somebody comes along. Even if I have no clue what I'm looking for. Somebody comes like, no, I'm just looking. I don't know. I just, just, that's my instinctual reaction. Every time. It drives Kristen absolutely crazy. Yeah, um, yeah she, she don't mind asking. I have a problem. With it. But here's the thing. When we understand that we don't know everything... That is an immensely humbling experience. And notice what the psalmist said there. Make me to know your ways. Why? Because I don't know it all. I have deficiencies in my life, in my knowledge. I need to know things. And when we approach it with that kind of humility... It opens up the Bible in a different way. Because so many times we approach the Bible um, as just, well, just tell me what I need to know so I can just go about my business. Instead, we approach it and say, you know what? My life is aimless and directionless on my own. I need to plug into a source that is deeper and greater than myself. And when we do that, it changes everything. We approach the Bible with humility and with an attitude of prayer. Lord, teach me. Because I don't know. I need some instruction in my life. Not just rules to follow, but I need to know you and know what you want in my life. And because the Bible is God's book, because it is a divine book, it can only be truly understood correctly with spiritual eyes. This is one of the most challenging aspects of reading and studying the Bible. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. What Paul means by this is that there are things in life, the only way you will know them to be true is the fact that you have a relationship with God, that you see them with spiritual eyes. And it's just not something that naturally comes your way. Here's where that's dangerous. And I even debate on even pointing this out, but I want to make sure we're clear on this. I have experienced in my life, and perhaps you have too, people who have some kind of screwy interpretations of things. You've probably never met anybody like that. Um, they have some different ways of see, seeing things. And they may, in the process, say, well, it's just, it's spiritually discerned. You're just not as spiritual as I am. That's why you can't understand the way I do. There's a danger in that. See, so many times we want to think, well, that's just your interpretation. We can have different interpretations and everything be fine. But you can't always have two different interpretations. Sometimes people are just wrong. Sometimes they're just wrong. And people are just wrong in how they view things. So be very careful. And we'll look at some of the basic rules of interpretation later on in our study. But we have to make sure that we always evaluate what we think, what we believe spiritually, to see if we're correct. I had a professor in college who said, if you're the first person in 2,000 years to come up with this idea, you're probably wrong. Uh, because... You know, you're not that smart, is what he told us as students. He said, you're not that smart, and that's how heresy happens. People come up with something they've never thought of before, and it just leads people astray. So there's, there's benefits to having that knowledge of how things have been looked at over the years. And so we need to very, uh, very, be very careful that we approach the Bible humbly and not think that we have it all figured out. 
and that our interpretation is the only right one. And so we also need to read it thoughtfully and carefully as a result of that. I say in Timothy 2 says, think over what I say. Use your brain. God gave you a brain for a reason. You know, you don't throw your brain out the window just because you start reading the Bible. Okay, so so don't people want to do that, and I don't understand that. Okay, God gave you a brain, He gave you capacity to think and to rationalize things. And faith is not just something in our hearts, it's also something in our brains. And we think and we believe in order to understand better who God is and what He wants for us in this life. So be very careful that we don't um, just approach things willy-nilly and still we think over things very carefully. And it says, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Okay, God helps us in our thinking when we approach it very carefully. So what is the result of reading the Bible? What's the result? Well, ultimately, life change. That's the goal. That's what we're after. We're not after anything unusual or, or you know, we're not looking for the skies to open up and lights to come down or, you know, angels to show up. We just want to be different. We want to be different people. That's the goal of Bible reading. Let's take what God says to apply it to our lives and to live differently as God changes us through the study of His Word. Uh, Jesus says in John 15, if you abide in me, you remain, if you stay close, if you stick close to Jesus and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now that verse used to always bother me. It used to always just trouble me because there's other places where Jesus says, whatever you ask for in prayer, it will be done for you. And I'm thinking, God, that's not how it works for me. I ask all the time and you don't do it. But then you've got to remember the first part of that. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Here's what Jesus means by that. If you've been changed by him and by his words, you're going to think differently. And guess what? You're going to ask for different stuff than you would ask otherwise. And you're going to ask for things in keeping with God's will. And God always is going to give you what is in accordance with his will because you know him better and you've been changed by him. So Bible reading impacts your prayer life. It changed how you pray. It's an incredible reality. By this, Jesus says, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. He wants us to grow and to produce fruit in our lives. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, what are his commandments? In the Bible, the Word of God. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. You hear what Jesus is saying there? He's saying that our relationship with Him, as we study His Word, as we know Him better, it changes our prayer life. It produces fruit in our lives. It produces joy in our lives. And we have love. That's an amazing reality. An amazing truth. As it comes from studying God's word. In Matthew 7. Everyone then who hears these words of mine. And does them. I want you to mark that. Does them. It's not just hearing it. It's doing it. James says, don't be a hearer of your word only, and so deceive yourselves. Be a doer of the word also. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew a bit against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You notice in that passage, Jesus draws two clear distinctions between the one who hears his words and does them and the one who doesn't do what he's heard. As two people who build their lives on two different foundations. But I want you to notice something else that Jesus says there. Then the rain fell. In both situations, circumstances came. Difficulties happened. Life was hard. 
And the difference was not the circumstances that they went through. The difference is what the foundation of their life was built upon. That's the difference. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Is it easy? Not always. Is it pleasant? Not always. Sometimes I get up in the morning, I look at my Bible, and it looks like a giant two-by-four sitting there on the table waiting to whoop me upside the head. And God has an amazing ability to bring passages to me in my personal reading time that I really just didn't want to hear that particular day. But God knew I need. And it's amazing how God's Word has that effect. And there's other days where I'll just read and I'll be like, God, how would you know? I mean, as if I have to ask that question, but it's still the, the, the natural response. How did you know that I, I needed that encouragement today? I need to be reminded of your love, your grace. Um, it's an amazing thing. And, and like I said, there's places where um, the Bible just doesn't always have that ring to it. Um, Sunday, we, we handed out the, the, the prayer directors and the Bible reading plans. Well, I cheated a little bit. I started my Bible reading plan last week. Because I know me, and if I don't start early, I'll, I'll finish late. So I want to start early and I can finish on time. And this morning, as I was reading, I was in Genesis 12, the call of Abram. And I noticed something I'd never noticed before. And I just want to share it with you because it just was amazing to me. Every time Abram or Abraham goes from one place to another. He goes from Haran to Canaan, and then from Canaan to Egypt, and, and places in between. Every time he gets to another destination, it says he builds an altar and he calls upon the name of the Lord. And I read that, I think that's really cool, because every time Abraham had a major encounter in his life, a major life change, his immediate response was worship. That's what that's supposed to say, is worship. Call on the name of the Lord. He built an altar. He sacrificed to God. He gave thanks to God. Every change, every major circumstance of his life, he called on the name of the Lord. And as I read that, I just prayed, Lord, let every circumstance of my life be filled with worship. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have read that passage. And I've read those very words. And just read over. Didn't mean a thing to me. Abraham went from here to here to here to here to here. Okay. But it was like this morning, God just needed to remind me that worship needs to be an important, valuable component in every circumstance of my life. Now, does that mean every time I get in my truck and drive from Denmark to Columbia, I need to get out and, and, and worship? No, that's not what that means. It's not a literal, you know, doing that. But it does mean every time there's a major event in my life, which waking up every morning is really a major event when you think about it, um, that, that there needs to be an attitude of worship about it. That's just what God told me in my time this morning. You read that same passage next week, and you might get something really different out of it. Not totally different, but different. A different emphasis. Or as I like to say to some people, you've got to make sure you put the right emphasis on the right syllable. Okay. Um, so, hear the word and do them. Now, here's we need to make sure that camera wides out next week so that we can get the peanut gallery over here. So, anyway, here's your homework. I want you to read two passages um, this week, between now and next week. Read two passages. Read Psalm 25 and read John 15, 1 through 17. You'll benefit just from reading those passages. But, but here's what I want you to do as you read them. Think about how Bible reading impacts your relationship with God as you read those passages. Uh, we've looked at some of those verses tonight, but think about how uh, that impacts your Bible reading. And, and what does the psalmist ask of God in Psalm 25? And how can Bible reading aid in that place? We looked at some of that already tonight. And what is the image that Jesus uses in John 15 Describe the relationship of believers of us to himself and how we're reading the Bible correctly aid in fostering that relationship. Just some questions as you read those passages tonight. Uh, I'm excited. Um, and we're going we're to look at some different things in the Bible as we go forward through this quote-unquote boot camp. 
Uh, we're going to really dig apart some passages. There's going to be a lot of interactive stuff some weeks, which I know some of y'all will probably you know, clam up a little bit. I'm not asking for dialogue so much as just going to have to do some stuff. And um, I'm going to walk you through part of what I do as part of my sermon process. Uh, one of the things I do when I write a sermon is I take a passage of Scripture, and if it's not a, except a long passage, I'll print it out on a piece of paper just like this, triple space, so big, big spaces in between it. And I will take a pen, and a lot of times I take a fountain pen just because it feels more um, intense to use a fountain pen. And I will just mark it all up. I'll circle words, I'll draw lines, I'll do all kinds of stuff. And at the end of it, I want to I feel like I really know that passage. And that's what I do when I prepare my sermons for Sunday. And that just begins the process. I want to walk you through some of that as we go forward so that you could do that same thing um, yourself. <coughs> if you so desire. That's the point of boot camp. To get you the skills you need for the life ahead. So let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, once again for the privilege of studying your word. May we not only hear it, but let us do it as you strengthen us and provide for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.